hello everyone. It's Friday evening in the U.S. at least, and uh, it should be uh, almost uh, afternoon in Australia. And this is an Australian case. It takes place in Tasmania. So I welcome anybody here from Australia. Uh, my name is criminal profiler Pat Brown. Did I just say that? <laughs> I've already forgotten how I started the show. Anyway, that's who I am. And um, if you would like to participate in the live portion of the show, because we do have a chat room, we have a wonderful community in the chat room, and uh, what you need to do is go below and join Patreon and become part of that community. And likewise, if you want to, to join me for the um, hangouts I have every week and for the live call-ins, those are live shows too, uh, join Patreon and that's who gets to participate. But all my videos are available to everyone. So if you haven't ever subscribed to the show, please do that. Subscribe, like, and share with people. All right, let's see who's here. Hold on a second, I'm already hot. Whew. Okay. All right. Oh my goodness. Hi, everybody. Anna's here. Lisa's here. Florence is here. Carrie's here. Um, and who else? Well, I got to go back up now. <laughs> and Anna's here. Did I already say that? I'm repeating myself tonight. What's going on here? <clears throat> you know, it's Friday night. I don't know what that means. But anyway, this is going to be a really interesting show because this is a case where this particular woman has been convicted and has been spending many years in prison for the murder of her longtime partner. And this is one of these Innocence Project type of shows where many, many people believe she was wrongly accused and that this woman and a couple of her buddies were the actual ones who killed this guy and this woman should not be in prison. Um, she has lost her recent appeal, so she's still in prison. And I will explain this whole case because it is, it is a very fascinating case because of the issue of the circumstantial evidence over here and the physical evidence over here. And I'll explain that to you in a bit. All right, so whatever happened here. Hi, Molly. Um, what happened? This is Bob Chappell. He um, was murdered on January 26, 2009, so about 13 years ago. Yeah, that's about right, 13 years ago. It uh, was a murder that occurred in Hobart in Tasmania. Um, and this woman over here, her name is full name is Susan Blythe Neil Frazier, but people just pretty much call her Sue or Sue Neil Frazier. I'll call her Sue. I'll call him Bob. Okay, to make it easy. All right. And they were partners for many years, I think 17. And um, one day he was missing from the yacht. And the yacht that they had was called the Four Winds. All right, let me show you their, their beautiful boat. It's a very lovely boat, a very large boat, as a matter of fact. Um, it's this boat here. Isn't that pretty? It's a very, very large. I think they called it Catch. Catch? <laughs> okay. You can tell I don't sail. <laughs> you know, I, no, I sail, but you know, I sail with a champagne glass, you know, one of those evening sails, you know, like, let's, let's go for a lovely, let's go for a lovely sunset sail. Okay, fine. Two, two time, two hours around wherever with champagne. I'm good. Um, <laughs> I know nothing about boats. Absolutely nothing. So, and this is going to be an interesting point uh, because I don't know anything about uh, boats. I'm a profiler. This, boats are not, not my thing. And guess what? The jury and Australia has apparently, I just read about this, uh, Australia has the same kind of jury system pretty much that we have in the United States, which means a bunch of people who know nothing about anything, including sailing and boats, end up on a jury. And then they're supposed to understand what happened here. And I think that's, that kind of thing really bugs me. Uh, oh, they'll bring in experts to tell the jury what they should think. But let's face it, if you have no experience with it, you don't know which, what experts are telling you. And it's very, very convoluted and confusing. And um, uh, there's a lot in this case which is confusing. Um, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the fact that it did happen on a sailing vessel. And people don't understand uh, how boats work. Um, it also has to do with um, how to get to and from boats, where you, where you keep the boats at, um, who hangs around boats. It has to do with the DNA. There's all kinds of things here that an average person knows not a thing about. Um, I read the 16, well, what was it? 1,600 pages on my, my, my uh, iPad. That's what it was. Uh, 1,600 pages of the first jury 
uh, first trial. And about 1,400 of those pages were just dreadfully boring and I just wanted to go to sleep. And okay, I scrolled, you know. <laughs> that was my face. <laughs> it was horrible. I was just like losing my mind of the boredom of the massive amount of stupid questions. And uh, let me t ask about your background and about boats and to the point where you just can't even focus anymore. There was some important things in there, but they were shrouded in all of this other stuff. And on top of that, then the experts came in and over explained things to the point where you had no idea, you know, on their PhD level, what they were talking about. And so I felt sorry for this jury. I really did. So what actually happened? <laughs> I like what Carrie says. Carrie says, I know nothing about boats, but I'm a big fan of champagne. Yeah, you know. Yeah, there's uh, all kinds of ways to enjoy boats. I actually do like being on a sailboat. I have been on quite a few sailboats and really enjoyed them. Um, I prefer them over motor boats because I'm not, I'm kind of a chicken crap. So, you know, you know, that bounce, bounce kind of scares me a lot, especially if I don't trust the guy who's behind the wheel. Um, so sailboats to me are much more pleasant. Um, I, I really enjoy the way they feel. And, you know, I've, I've thought about learning how to sail, but just haven't gotten to it yet. So, but yes. But I don't know if a couple of wines, you're not even scared of the way the boat goes. <laughs> I, do, I do enjoy it. Uh, so anyway, let's see what happened on this particular incident. So these, this couple, let me, let me show you the couple. Um, my couple. Okay, so they were together, as I say, for many, many years. Um, seven, I believe it was about 17 years. Where are they? I've lost them. Well, well, none of us lost at sea, so, you know, there's only one left. She's in jail. Um, uh, here they, uh, so here they are. I'm trying to find the, the original picture. What? Something's going wrong with me already tonight. I have just, um, why do things go missing on me? That's not fair. I swear to God it was here before. It drives me crazy when that happens. And then somebody has to come in and say, well, you're ill-prepared. Yeah. <laughs> they might be right. I don't know. What happened to my picture? That is really strange. Anyway, I'm going to use this picture because I lost it. Anyway, so this couple been together for many, many years, and they decided to buy this boat. So let's say, let, let me tell you about it. He was a radio, radiation oncology medical physicist, physicist from Hobart, and his partner of 18 years, 18 years, uh, Sue. And they were owners, and she, he was, um, by the way, 65 at the time he died, and I think she was 50. Okay, well, how old was she when? I think she was in her 50s when he died. Um, or went missing, shall we say, because, you know, they, they claimed he is dead, uh, you know, but his body was never found. Um, they were the owners of a catch called Four Winds. The ship had been purchased in Queensland in September 2008 and had been brought to Hobart in December of 2008. From about 9 a.m. on the 26th of January, Chapel or Bob was on the yacht while it was moored in the River Derwent, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this right, so sorry, folks from Tasmania. Uh, <laughs> uh, River Derwent, uh, and it was moored. And by the way, I looked this up the issue about being moored because, quite frankly, I was like, where do you put your where do you, where do you put a sailboat? Uh, this is the location. Let me show you the basic location uh, that they were in. Uh, unless I unless I copied the wrong one here, but I, I think it was this this see see this beautiful location I hope I got the right place here. But I do think it's correct um, And you see all these boats and so they're not sailing there I believe they're moored at this point and then there's these places where you can actually have docks and if you look here For example, you see uh, This is this is at the, you know the shoreline and so there are many people there are docks where you know the type you walk out on and jump into the boat um, and then there are those that are moored out in the water. And that's an important point in this story because of who done did it, is who would have gotten in a dinghy and gone out to the boat to commit this crime and come back, okay? Because it wasn't like it was on the shore, you know, one of these places where you could just walk out, you know, and say, hey, let's jump on that boat. That's an important issue here. So anyway, let's go back to where they were at. So now what they did was it was moored in the River Derwent off Mary, Marieville, I think it was Marieville Esplanade. And again, I'm pronouncing everything wrongly. 
for the purposes of working on it. They both had some issues, and so they had to, there was a lot of work that needed to be done. Okay, so Sue uh, was with him for a short time in the morning, and so she was, she was on the boat with Bob. I'm sorry, so I just said, yeah, Bob. Okay, so she's on the boat with Bob. Here's, here's, here's all Bob on the boat, but she's on the boat with him, um, and they're hanging out, and then she's gonna go have lunch with her sis. So she, ret she t gets on the dinghy. It's a white inflatable dinghy. That's the yacht tender, okay? A tender being something that goes back and forth, and a dinghy is a, a crappy little tender. Okay, so it's a white inflatable. So it's a, you know, just, you just, and it's got, a little, it's got a little engine on, so you can, you know, go back to shore. And so she jumped on that and went back to shore. And there's actually the last photo of her on that day does exist. Um, let me find it. Okay, here she is. Okay, this is Sue Neil Fraser at the Royal Yacht Club, and on the day, and it is Australia Day. I, I, you know, not being from Australia, I don't know how you all celebrate, but it's Australia Day. So, anyway, here she is, and so that's a picture of her at the Royal Yacht Club. And again, I want you to look carefully around you and see what you see. At the Yacht Club, there are many yachts, lots of boats right there parked at the dock area. All right, so that's where she was. All right, so what happened with her? Now, so she goes and has some lunch, and then she gets back on the, the, the dinghy and returns to this boat with Bob at 2 o'clock. Then, and later in the afternoon, and that's always a little questionable, maybe 4 o'clock-ish, maybe, whatever-ish, she returns to the shore in the tender, and he remains on the yacht, okay? Now, there's, there's questions even here about this issue, and, and I wish I had good answers. I wish I was an investigator at this point to ask this question. His son says he wouldn't have stayed on the, uh, on, on the yacht for the overnight because he had been recently having some health problems, uh, like his, uh, he's having these weird, like horrible bleeding nose problems, and had been at the hospital, and he actually didn't come in the boat back to Tasmania. She came with some help, but he actually flew in because he was in a hospital dealing with whatever was wrong with him. And he's in his 70s. Oh, no, I'm sorry, 65. Oh, he's younger than me. <laughs> oh, he's a, he's a young boy. Like, okay. Um, so, you know, I forget I'm 66 sometimes. Okay, so he's only 65. Oh, that, okay, that means that's young. Okay, but okay. supposedly maybe he was concerned about his health. So the question is, would he have stayed overnight? His son said he was very cautious about safety and he wouldn't have been that pleased about staying overnight and having the tender not be there. In other words, Bob could have gotten in the tender with Sue, taken her to land, and then returned to, to the Four Winds. And then he would have the tender there in case he didn't feel well in the night or something was wrong. He could get in there and go back to shore. And there was some claims later that, oh, the reason he didn't do that is because he had trouble getting in and out of the tender. Um, that he was like, again, ancient beyond belief. I mean, you know, I'm going to say this. If you're going to have a sailboat and you're going to sail on the, on the, on the waters, uh, maybe you don't want to sail across the ocean. But let me tell you, you can't be a little total wimp to sail a sailboat. I do know that. You got to have enough strength to pull ropes and you got to be able to get, you know, have balance and you got to be able to get on and off things. Or you're not going to, you're not going to be on this, 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 this boat. So don't tell me this man can't get into a, a tender and, and ferry himself back to the shore. And, you know, so she, you know, so he couldn't get in and out. That's just nonsense. So it's really weird to me that she left him there without that when he could have taken her, just zipped her up there, let her out and come back and got back on the boat. And he would have that there for his use. I thought that was strange. Anyway, and so did some other people. But anyway, so this is what happened. She goes back to shore. Now, he remained on the ship. Somewhere between um, 11.30 p.m. and midnight, there's a man, and this becomes an issue with the Innocence Project who's, that's fighting for her. And I'll point out what they're saying about this. Uh, there is a man parked at the end of the rowing sheds on the Mar uh, Marieville, I think it's Marieville, Esplanade. Um, when he saw and heard an inflatable dinghy with an outboard on the back coming from the direction of the Royal Yacht Club. Remember, that's where she parked the dinghy. Now, 
somebody is coming from there in this back toward uh, the four winds Hughes said that there was only one person in it who had the outline of a female but he could not be definite so but he saw a dinghy with one person that he thought was a white dinghy going toward the ship I mean the yacht all right so now what happens is about about 5 40 the next day a different witness found the dinghy bobbing against the rocks okay let me show you a little picture about where it was bobbing against the rocks and i'm going to point out you know once in a while when i do some of these shows you have to really pay attention because it gets confusing and i will try to jump in on your comments so you can say i don't understand what's going on <laughs> um but i'm going to try to explain it to you and then i'll re-explain it to you when i come to the prosecution and the defense i'm just trying to get the basics out right now um so anyway she's so she's on land he's on the sh um, on the yacht and in the morning they say something something's fishy here they they find the um let me show you where that uh, thing was okay so here we have a picture uh you can see it says where the x is that's where the four winds was moored and again, you'll see lots of other little white spots. And I, I believe that is basically where you have other boats moored. Um, I can't say that for sure, but I would assume that the Four Winds is not the only boat moored out there. There are many boats moored. I think they're the ones, if I'm correct, because I don't know crap about this, may have, you know, keels that are, you know, maybe they're, they're too deep for the being next to the dock. Or if I'm completely wrong on that, they just don't have dock space. They just haven't paid for it, so they just moor on a whatever. I have no idea because I'm an idiot with this stuff. Anyway, so if you look down at the bottom, you'll see it says the white dinghies left at the Royal Yacht Club. That's where Sue said she tied it up. The next day, we see W2 up a little further. It says the dinghy was found bouncing against the rocks up there. Okay, that's where they saw that. All right. But now what was happening? All right. This is what was happening. The next thing that they saw was this. Um, uh, the witness secured the, 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 um, the bobbing uh, dinghy. With another man, he headed out in a boat. They, as they passed the four winds, they noticed it was very low, low in the water on its mooring. They boarded it. Shortly after, members of the Tasmania police arrived as a result of the call because it was like sinking okay so it's actually sinking um now so the the police get on there they notice blood on the steps and i let me see if i can find you the picture of now this is coming from by the way i, I got some of these photos from the innocence project for sue and so um i'm going to show these to you and some of these will have commentary on it i just was too lazy to cut out all the commentary pro or Pro or con is not the point. I just want to show you these pictures. So what they found was when they got on, they found blood on the steps. And I'm not sure we, oh yes, there you see up on the right-hand corner here, there was only a small amount of fresh blood on the steps. That was his blood. Ropes were cut and the toilet hose was cut. So what happened here was um, they found that and they found a knife. They found a knife on the floor of the wheelhouse and the torch with blood on it. And by the way, if you're an American, a torch is not a stick with fire coming out of it. That is a flashlight. <laughs> Believe me, a lot of Americans do not know that. <laughs> I only know that because I watch British shows and Sherlock Holmes. So, um, but uh, we think uh, in the US, we think of torches as definitely being wood with, with fire coming out of it. Um, and um, interesting enough one of the things that sue says later when she's talking with the police is that oh my fingerprints will be on that torch uh and it could be because she used the torch a lot but she did point that out even though um there was um also blood on it anyway let me see here now uh, okay where was i at all right so there was um blood on the torch and no trace of chapel so he was not on their yacht the yacht was low in the water and sinking the causes were located. A pipe to the, it says here, forward toilet, and it's got a little four with an apostrophe ard. So I would say forward toilet, but I guess that's not what it is. Forward toilet. And you can see up on the left side, you can see it's cut. It's actually literally cut and water is pouring in. Allow, this allowed the sea water to flow in. It was also discovered that a seacock under the flooring in the for, forward part of the yacht 
had been opened, allowing seawater to flow in. Uh, and this is going to become a very pivotal part of this case, this thing called a seacock. It's underneath the flooring. It was unused for any purposes at that point in time, uh, but it was under flooring in a place that pretty much nobody should know was even there unless you knew the ship really well. So somebody had allowed these two locations, the cutting of that, uh, a cutting of the, uh, the pipe, uh, to allow the water in and also to open up the sea cock thing uh, had been opened, allowing the seawater to flow, flow in. So they found two ways to let the seawater onto the, the, the yacht so the yacht would sink. All right. Now, the police experienced the Marine and Rescue Services took the view, and they took the view, that the person responsible for cutting the pipe and opening the sea cock had an intimate knowledge of the four winds. Uh, particularly in the case of the seacock, which was under a carpet and a panel, which served no apparent purpose. So, you know, we're talking about a panel over it and then a carpet over it, so no one would even know it's there. So they thought that was, that, that just really set off alarm bells for them going, whoever did this knows this yacht. All right, so, so one of the problems with this case is that, um, that Sue obviously did know the yacht. And the other person, which we'll, we'll be talking about, Megan and her buddies would not have known the yacht. So this becomes an issue in this case. Uh, so anyway, they, they were very looking at that saying that's pretty weird. Anyway, they pumped the water out of the, the, uh, the yacht. And um, at that point, they, they towed it to Constitution Dock. Constitution Dock is... Let me see if I can, I believe it's, it's in this area. And, and one of the problems when, I, when you're looking at these cases, and I say this all the time, this is, this is I believe, Constitution Dock. They tow it there, is that a lot of times we aren't exactly sure what exactly happened when from what we're, we're hearing. But this is what it says. Um, so they towed it to the Constitution Dock on the 27th of January. About 4.30 p.m. Now, this was towed in the morning to this dock. Now, one would assume it's a crime scene. One, one would assume it's well protected, but I have no proof of that. At about 4.30 p.m., uh, Sue, Neil Frazier, and others went on board. She pointed out a number of anomalies on the yacht. She said that a green rope on the starboard side was in disarray and out of place. She pointed out that a winch handle was in the winch on the main mast, and it should not have been there. And the winch issue is a very important issue because there, there's only really good, one good reason the winch was used, and we'll get to that. Uh, she said that a rope around the winch had been cut and another rope was on a pile on the deck. And she pointed out something. But nothing, nothing of worth was missing. I think this is important. And if this is not brought up enough, I think, that usually if you do go on to, you know, uh, if you're going on to a yacht for any other reason than, I don't know, for fun or to kill somebody, you're going there to steal, but nothing was taken of any worth uh, at all. Um, anyway, now they had, they did, the next thing they did was use the inflatable dinghy, which was her dinghy. They used luminol on it, okay? So here, by the way, here's her dinghy, okay? And this was the luminol in the dinghy. Now, this is, this is from the defense side, so I'm just pointing out that's why you see here it says there was no blood found in the dinghy, yet the jury was led to believe there was blood in the dinghy. Uh, they were led to believe that his body was carried in this dinghy, that the dinghy that had been found now floating about, um, not, more, not tied up, um, was, the, was used in this crime. That's what they were led to believe, and therefore, since it was used in this crime, it would, you, could be only used for a couple of things. One is to get to the boat, and one is to get away from the boat and also to possibly put a body in the boat and take it out further. And, and then there was a, a missing um, fire extinguisher, which the theory is it was tied to him. And he was then sunk very, very in the deep areas of this River Derwent um, or Derwent, how you pronounce it. So since they didn't find his body around the actual boat, they assumed that this dinghy was used or a dinghy was used to take the body somewhere farther away into a depth, bigger depth and then sunk. And um, 
and then so the dinghy would have a big use so if it was if it was that dinghy then the luminol may be saying his body was in it if it was a different dinghy well then i don't know what that would mean okay so now so the inflatable dinghy um had many areas that were positive to luminol a screening test for blood but not a conclusive one correct could be something else in there um now the next part is interesting on uh, January 28th, which is the very next day, the yacht was moved to the premises of Clean Lift Marine at Goodwood and placed on a slip for inspection. This becomes an issue. So this was left overnight here. And again, I say, was it properly guarded or could somebody have boarded the boat in the night for whatever reasons? I don't know. Um, there's some seems to be missing information on it. But they took it to a place called this. This is called Clean Lift. And apparently this is where, you know, you take your boats out of the water. Now, once you do that, they have this, they have this lot of boats. You see these, these different boats, they're set up. So you can work on them and whatever they do to these boats, right? Which I know nothing about whatsoever. However, somebody asked this question, um, where, which was this. How long was the boat actually sitting down on the water, you see? and not actually up here. Because if it was up here and this was a guarded area with fence around it and theoretically some kind of, uh, some kind of um, uh, wa somebody watching this somehow, um, you would think it would be difficult for anybody to get in there and get onto the boats. But here, if it's still in the water, eh, maybe, maybe it's possible that somebody, if it sat in the water for a while before they pulled it actually up, Somebody could access that with a dinghy or just walk up next to it and just jump onto it. So that's an interesting possibility. All right, so anyway, they took that there. And in the following days, a great number of items, samples and swabs were taken. And here was an interesting point. This is when they found some DNA on the boat, on the deck, that did not belong to um, Bob or Sue. It belonged to the girl. <laughs> and this is where it all gets very weird and interesting. So it belongs to this girl. That girl. All right, who is that girl? Hmm. Who is that girl? All right, so this girl is, a, she's a 15-year-old uh, homeless drug addict. It's her DNA that's on the deck of this boat. They ask it, the police interviewer she says i was not near the boat i was not on the boat i'm not talking to you guys i had nothing to do with the boat and that kind of went by the wayside for quite a while now she, they did have her at the trial and at the trial she claimed she was not on the boat either even though her her dna was on the deck um now there was a lot of question whether the dna was a transfer dna because um but when they moved the boat into shore and they moved the boat, you know, they had the boat sitting there. Could some, could, could, could somebody, could something have been on the dock and somebody stepped on it and then stepped on the boat and transferred her DNA? It's possible. They, at that time, they did not get anything out of her except she wasn't anywhere near there and she was not on the boat. Um, and they had other reasons not to look at her and to look at Sue instead. And so that's what we'll get to. But I will get to the defense side of it in a bit when they talk. They did a 60 minute show, uh, 60 minutes Australia. She is a very troubled, she's just very troubled. <laughs> she was very troubled, she's a druggie. She's a druggie and this is years later, 10 years later and she's still a druggie. And she's in the show, they ask her how long she's been clean and she's like, recently, and I'm thinking 45 minutes, maybe, you know, <laughs> you know. So anyway, they, 60 minutes did a lot of shows in conjunction, in conjunction with the, the Innocence group that's supporting that this girl actually eventually confesses to being on the boat and Sue didn't do it. So now we'll go back. Okay, now I'm gonna check, just check your comments before I go on to why they convicted her. All right, it's Kay Robs here, hi, hey, hi. And um, Lisa, already this is much more informative and clearly presented than anything else I've seen on this case. Gosh, I'm so glad you say that because it, it's, it's, kind, it's kind of convoluted. It's convoluted and a little bit difficult to understand. Um, and it's, it's not one of these that's very easy to present uh, because there is so much information. But I just try, I'm trying to break it down into something that 
Well, hopefully it makes sense. All right, I'm going to go to now why did the police suspect Sue? Let's go back and take a look at Sue. Sue, druggy girl, drug, homeless druggy girl whose DNA was found on the deck. Just a little bit of it. Nobody else's, but just hers. But why did they suspect Sue? You know, why would they think such a thing? I mean, this is, this is crazy. Why would she go out and kill, kill him? All right, I'm going to put this on in the background. I took this picture, but it's just pretty. And it also represents that some of this had to happen at night, okay? So, what actually happened? So, Sue, this is why the police suspected Sue. So, you know, when people attack sometimes the law enforcement for, for focusing in on somebody, how dare you focus in on her when it could be something else? And, I, oh, let me show you what the something else could be, as a matter of fact, because the, the Innocence Project is supporting her, uh, the, uh, Sue, this is, they came up with this. I thought it was pretty funny. Scenarios not excluded. Okay. Megan Voss, that's, that's the homeless girl. Her DNA was found on the yacht. That's true. And th so they did not exclude the scenario of Megan Voss and her friends killed Bob. Okay. Homeless men on the foreshore with criminal records. Okay. So there were some homeless people that were on the shore and apparently the police did not exclude these people for reasons because there's no reason to exclude them because what do, what do homeless people have to do with in general have to do with the death of pop Ch uh, bob chapel then they say a suicide okay well there was <laughs> i don't think he could suicide himself well i guess he could like put a well he had to get away i'm trying to even think okay i'm trying to think for a minute here how how is he going to suicide himself so he had to hurt himself enough to put blood there then the DNA of somebody else shows up there. Then his girlfriend says a lot of weird things that don't make sense. And then he, okay, um, he decides to tie himself up to a fire extinguisher, get, get into the, um, get into the little rubber rafty thing and float far, far away and dump himself overboard but the somehow the dinghy goes from the depths of this river which is more like a like an ocean almost and happens to float right back into where it's supposed to be <laughs> you know really i don't think so that's really kind of unlikely but they, apparently they said the police didn't consider it and it isn't that the police didn't it's just they're making this list an intentional disappearance yeah um somehow he decided he just wanted to go missing never been found again drug smugglers what the hell do drug smugglers have to do with this anyway? Although Sue did bring up, maybe well, this was a drug smuggling thing, which there's no evidence of whatsoever. Uh, did bloke on the, wait a minute, a man who made a significant threat. I did the bloke on the yacht for cash, but will do you for free. What? Okay, a weather beaten man <laughs> seen near the four winds. Well, you know, well, you ought to go after weather beaten men. I mean, you know, this, you know, you're near a shipping, you're, you're near an area with a lot of people who, sale they're all weather beaten a, a serial killer <laughs> okay dokie then uh a gray dinghy seen by four people in in days leading up to bob's disappearance the gray dinghy thing i'm going to uh, uh, deal with that okay some unidentified dna yet to be matched whatever friends who came on board at some point some workers whatever you know none of this stuff you know uh who okay that's the list the list is ridiculous Okay, so this is one of the things when people, when they're trying to find somebody innocent, come up with absolutely foolishness. And it's not a, I think it's a bad idea. Um, because if you want to prove somebody's innocent, you want to stick with the evidence and not bring up a whole bunch of outrageous, stupid theories. So that then people go, you're morons, and then don't pay any attention to anything else you say, which might have validity. So don't do that. So if you're working police, guys, if you're working on trying to get somebody that you believe is innocent out of prison, stick with the evidence. Um, okay, so all of these crazy things comes right down to two things. There's only two real stories in this. Let me show you what they are. Oh, it's hard to believe, but it's going to be one or one of two things. Sue did and her boyfriend or the, the homeless druggy girl and her two buddies for some reason got onto the boat maybe to steal things. And that was a story that she was on 60 minutes and I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit 
That's why she did it. They they came on board to steal stuff, and they ran into him, and he got got mad, and there was an altercation, and they 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 beat him to death. And it's not an unreasonable theory. Okay, I'm okay with it. And there's not an unre unreasonable theory over here either. But these are the only two theories. There's no serial killer running around here, <laughs> and there's no drug involvement here, and there's none of these other ridiculous theories. One or the other. So let's just stay with what what's sensible. All right. So. Now let's go. Let's go. Let's go back. However, to Sue and that night. Now there, the reason there's a real problem that the that the the police focused in on Sue is because her story changed five times, and she admits that in court. Five times, and um, the the people who were, who were trying to support her actually try to explain away every one of the times she changes her stories. I'll show you that in a minute. So what originally happened was she said she tied up her dinghy. Remember, she left left him on the boat. And also she left her, her phone with him. I'm, I'm really not sure why two people, two people who can afford a yacht don't have two cell phones. But for whatever reasons, there's one cell phone her cell phone and so she leaves it with him so she, he could call her if he wanted to okay and she could call him she could call him from the house phone he could call her from the cell phone all right okay. that's that's at least some some protective measure okay um she says she left she got she comes and she ties up the dinghy at the royal yacht club and she goes to bunnings warehouse for a long time now, Bunnings Warehouse, uh, I looked it up. Apparently, it's like Home Depot in the U.S., but more like a place where a lot of people, you know, especially with boats, love to go and find tons and tons of stuff. It's huge. Um, I hate shopping. My, my, I, my purpose when I shop is to get in and out within seven minutes because after that, I freak out. I just do not like, I hate big warehouses. I want to shop in little stores. I just, I don't like it. I've never liked big places with lots of stuff. But, Apparently, I'm in the minority, so a lot of you guys, oh, I can't wait to go to whatever and go up and down those aisles. I'm just not a shopper. <laughs> you know, I'm not a shopper. What can I say? And so, so Bunnings apparently is this place where a lot of people love to go and just go up and down the aisles. She claims she went up and down those aisles for hours. Hours. And never bought anything, but hours. Which made people kind of, <laughs> hey, I'm with you there, K Rob. Oh, my God so true i like online shopping i you know sometimes i hate to support amazon but <laughs> yeah, works for me yes um <laughs> i have to put this i'm going to put this up just because i'm going to get into this later but but molly has a good point point. and before they beat him to death this is the this is the druggy girl and her two buddies who supposedly some other older homeless dude and her and her boyfriend or something they before they beat him to death he told them where to cut what to sink the boat and confuse the police yeah that makes sense yeah it's a little confusing how they would know these things were there or that they would do that but hey you know let's let's leave that alone for for a while why not an alien abduction i don't know they should have put that on the list i, I do believe that would have been useful um uh, they hadn't owned the yacht for long they had owned it let me go back so because that's an important point lisa I think that's important to know. They they had the reason why they would both of these pe both of these being owners of that yacht would know things is that they bought the yacht. When did they buy the yacht? Um, purchased in two, September of two thousand eight. Brought to Hobart in December, and she, and he died in January. So September, October, September, October, November, December. They had it for almost five months. But was, what was even more important was they were fixing things and they knew about stuff that needed to be worked on and they also had workers on there that were showing them things. So they, anybody would have knowledge of this, this particular yacht uh, where I would think a homeless girl, 15 year homeless girl, we're gonna, we're, we can just say, if you watch the 60 minute show, I'm going to say she, she's lucky she knew she was on the planet Earth. You know, um, she, she couldn't know nothing, nothing about a boat. Now, maybe her boyfriend did or the older dude, but they would have to know this boat, specifically with that seacock thing that was hidden 
and they would have no reason to know it was even there. That's that's one of the weird things. But maybe they found it. You know, maybe they found it. You never know. So I think that's important to say. Sometimes people get lucky. Who knows? Um, <laughs> that's funny. I just drove past the Bunnings, rushing home to catch this show. What you didn't stop for hours and go look for stuff, huh? <laughs> Uh, this is this is also true. Carrie says both Sue and the young woman on 60 Minutes, uh, Megan, Megan, the homeless girl, changed their stories. Yes, she changed her stories. Both of them changed their stories many times, which is why this is such an interesting case, because it's like, can we believe no one? Because <laughs> no one can tell the truth. But Sue especially, we're talking about someone who is not on drugs, not someone who should be out to lunch. This, is, this should be a woman who has her wits about her, um, who is able to sail a, sail a, sail a boat, um, who's raised children, who, you know, I, I'm going to say, hey, somebody like me, you know, I mean, I have my wits about me. I, I, I'm, I, when you come and talk to me about what happened yesterday or what I did, I should be able to tell you that because I'm not on drugs. I'm not a drunk and um, I don't have Alzheimer's, you know, so although. Some of the people supporting her are claiming she may be having early Alzheimer's and that's why she's having the problems. <laughs> so you see how they tried to find an excuse for what happened. Well, let me tell you what happened, which is why it gets so weird. All right. So she says she came in and she's not now she's in Bunnings. Um, OK, this is the this is the interview that's the following day. So and this to me is the most important interview because the earliest interview is always the more the one you're going to have the best memory and you're going to be usually the most truthful, you know, because right there and then you're going to say exactly what happened. Um, and it was the day after. And for all the excuses in the world, like you know, you're in shock and all this kind of stuff, when something horrific happens, usually you know exactly where you were at that moment. Um, my son had a horrific bike accident when he was five and I was with, with my husband at a, um, uh, an Airbnb at, in Ocean City, Maryland, Rehoboth, I'm sorry, Rehoboth, Maryland. Um, we had driven out, we'd left him at the, the, at the house of the pastor and while we were out, he had had this accident. And I remember when my, my husband had called his mother. Uh, to find out about my daughter who was at a different location to find out how she was doing because she had been sick and he didn't come back and and I went down to what's uh, to find out what's going on and I walked out and I saw him slumped on the stair stairs in the hall and I knew something was wrong right there and then and then I found out that you no know, my son's in the hospital uh, we we got our stuff together um, uh, actually I th you know, we when we drove back home I remember being in dead silence all the way there um, I mean it wasn't like it didn't know where it was or what I had been doing that day. You could ask me what I was doing that day, even though I was very upset. My, it was my son. And I didn't know if he was going to live. I still know what I did that day. I, I, I wasn't out to lunch, you know, so because especially because it like sears into your brain, you know, the whole thing, where were you when 9-11? Where were you? And, uh, you know, I don't, you know, for me, where was I when uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the missile attack, on <laughs> the Korean missile missile crisis in uh, Hawaii. Where was it? I know where I was. I was in Hawaii and Oahu. I know exactly where I was. I know what I felt at that moment. So that's usually when things sear into your brain. Usually, if somebody asks you like six months later, "What were you doing on 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 February 13th?" You're like, "I don't even remember February," you know, because nothing specific stands out. But if something really happened, especially the day after, you should damn well know where you were. Uh, so anyway, she said she went to Bunnings and she wandered about just uh, for a long time. She didn't buy anything. She browsed. It was starting to get dark when she arrived home. She mentioned there were phone calls that she made and received. And then she got off the telephone at 1030 p.m. There was a phone call that came into her at 1030 p.m. That accorded with the records. She said that she stayed alone at home that night and that the following morning she was notified that the yacht was sinking. She made no mention of leaving the house that whole evening. Okay, now, I, just, I stayed home, I didn't stay home. I stayed home, I didn't stay home. Those are two very different things, and you should know whether you left the house or you didn't leave the house, <laughs> you know. All right, this is on the 28th of January. On the 5th, she has another chit-chat with the police. 
She says then she left the Four Winds and went straight to Bunnings again. She said she drove in, turned left, and parked facing the buildings, arriving at roughly 4.40 p.m. near the checkouts. Uh, and then she said she was wearing a cream brim hat, a beige shorts, joggers, and sunglasses. She looked at timber and slip mats, turned right, looked at the paint section, and then she said she went up and down every aisle again, and she left by the same entrance. But she did arrive a little later then, you see. Okay, then on March 4th, she was interviewed again, and she said the same thing. I drove to, from the Yacht Club to Bunnings. Then she said she remembered feeling guilty when she did this because she thought that if the deceased phoned her, I always like the way they say it, if the deceased telephoned her, which would be hard to do if you're deceased. I just I always think that kind of funny. <laughs> um, um, he had her mobile, mobile and she was not at home. That's true. So in other words, he's got the phone, but he can't contact her because she's nowhere to be contacted. So if he had an emergency, how is he going to get hold of her? And if that's true that you were, were feeling guilty, I don't think you'd spend three hours at Bunnings. Maybe 20 minutes, but I think three hours or four hours or whatever she originally claimed. Like, what, you want something to, you want something to happen to this dude while you're running around the store forever so he can't get hold of you? So anyway, um, then she says she felt guilty about that. Uh, but however, she was aware now that the police had examined the CCTV footage at Bunnings and could not find her on it. And she retreated to claiming that she was pretty sure that she had gone there. Okay, there's the, there's the problem we have. Pretty sure. This is the day right before your man of 18 years has vanished. You don't know whether you were at the store or you went home. You know you, know you went to lunch with your sis. You know you went to the boat. But between the time you arrived back on the shore, you have no idea if you went to the store or you went home. But now they can't find you on the CCTV. Uh, Lisa says, I agree with Pat. I think you would try really hard to be accurate talking to the police straight after the event because any small detail might help you find your beloved if you want him found. That is also very true. I mean, we have this problem with missing children too that it pretty much you will lay yourself bare, you know, because you just can't, you can't take the risk of them going on some tangent and not focusing on what they need to focus on. Um, so you want them to know everything. But now they can't find her on the CCTV footage. <clears throat> she knows this now. So she said maybe, she's pretty sure she went there. Then she was told that Bunning shut that day at 6 p.m., which made it unlikely she could have been there for hours as she previously acc claimed. She, she, she could only have been there like an hour, maybe an hour and 50 minutes. Hours was impossible, although I still don't know how you spend hours. Although I did look that up, and a lot of people said they spent hours at Bunning. So I'm like, okay, wow, really? <laughs> Sorry. So... Maybe people do, but she couldn't have because the store closed at six. All right. Then, then four or five days later, more interesting things come up. And I'm reading this, by the way, I am reading straight from Wikipedia. I did do the entire 1600 pages, as I said, but you know, I just skim of the, the trial and I looked at all the appeal. But, you know, interestingly enough, Wikipedia has made it very clear. So, you know, sometimes you got to use what, what really is more useful. So anyway, now what happens next is, uh, okay, so now we're on the 8th of March. We're another, we're another four or five days, 8th or 10th of March. Now there's a, she had had a telephone, uh, a telephone conversation. And a friend, a friend had had a tele, tele, telephone conversation with her and said she was disturbed or anxious about the content of the telephone call from Richard King at 10.30. 10.30 at night, a man named uh, uh, Richard King called. And she was so disturbed by this phone call that she had driven down to Sandy Bay, looked across at the yacht, but it was darkness, and then drove back. Oh, so you didn't stay home all night, did you? You actually left the house. And you drove to, down to the water. So now you lied. That's a straight up lie. There's no way you didn't know that you left the house at, at late at night to go driving around looking at the yacht because you thought something was wrong. You can't tell me that that was, you know, you forgot. You forgot. So that was the next thing that made the police go, what? All right, now, a few more days later, she was interviewed by the ABC journalist Felicity Ogilvie. She told Ogilvy that after the telephone call from King at 10.30, she drove down to the boat to check that everything was okay. 
but she did not see anything going on at the yacht because it was completely dark and she couldn't see the yacht. <laughs> What? It's out in the water. I mean, it's, it's a dark yacht. I mean, what was she thinking it was on fire? I mean, what was what was the issue? What did she think she was going to see? So that, that, that it was not there, that it had sunk completely. What was she thinking? Um, and so she drove home. She added that she saw homeless people with fires down there. Okay. Ogilvy later provided that information to the police. It was the first time they were aware that she had returned to the, the, the shore there on the night in question, the, the Marieville Esplanade. I, I try to avoid saying because I can't say it. Um, so she didn't tell the police this. Somebody else told the police this. They ratted on her. Okay, now another 10 days later in March, Sanchez, the friend, had another telephone conversation with her in which she said that she had driven down there and then she had left the car there and walked back home for the exercise. And this is the first time she said she left the car there. So this is another one of her stories changing. Um, and here is where, uh, then she goes, okay, so now we're getting into May. So now we're five, five months later. Police interview her again, asked about what she had done that afternoon after going out to Four Winds. She said she'd been mistaken about going to Bunnings because you didn't see me on the CCTV. Yeah, um, I mixed that day up with another day. Mm -hmm. A few days early, I must've gone there, you know, and I just got confused. So then she said, so she had been on the yacht later than she remembered. So she really didn't go ashore and go shopping or walking around stores. She stayed there much, much later. And after tying up the dinghy at the Royal Yacht Club, she walked back to Allison Street, leaving her car there. And then she couldn't remember exactly where she left her car. But anyway, she didn't know if it was daylight or dark either. Then when she got the telephone call from this guy, this guy, King, the content of which unnerved her. And I'll explain that in a minute. It's really kind of weird. Um, she decided to collect the car and drive it home so it would be available for her to drive to the yacht if the deceased call, called her. <laughs> so, okay. So she's unnerved. So she's going to walk. So, so now her car's not there. She's going to walk back to get the car and bring the car home in case. This is, this, this is what really nails it right here for me. She decided not to telephone him, having regard to the lateness of the hour. He might be asleep. <laughs> okay, so you think something horrible is happening to your loved one. He's isolated on a boat and you're, you're fearful for his life. But you don't want to wake him up. And, you, know, you don't want to call him just in case he's sleeping. I mean, you could call him and he wakes up and says, why are you calling me? Oh, I'm sorry, honey. I just wanted to know if you're okay. I just suddenly had this terrible fear of something that was wrong. I got this weird phone call. And he goes, that's okay, honey. I'm okay. I think the man can go back to sleep. If I know men, he'd be asleep in one minute. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he'd be asleep in one minute. You know? Um, you know, this is kind of a funny thing because you often hear this kind of excuse where, for example, a man does not come home to his wife uh, when he's supposed to. And then he says later, well, I didn't want to call you because you might be asleep. And she says, you really thought I was going to be asleep? I was pacing the floors and I was saying to myself, if, if that man shows up, he better have a good excuse or I'm going to kill him. But, you know, <laughs> for me to believe that she didn't call him, especially when you just turn over and go back to sleep and she's that worried about him, she thinks it's wiser to draw, wait a minute, walk down there, get, oh, it gets so confusing. Go look to see whether the boat is still in the water and it's dark. So she sees a shape of a boat and she goes, oh, that makes me, and she said that made me feel better. Instead of just calling him and asking him if he's okay. And, you, and they wonder why the police think she's guilty. Now, I'm not saying she's guilty, but this is why the police are going, there's something wrong with this picture. Everything she says, she's changed all her stories. She makes no sense what she's saying. And there's so many confusing things about what she's done that night and why she did them. Um, so anyway, it goes a little further here. Um, it says she went to, she walked to her car. However, arriving there, she found she, oh, she had farm keys and not car keys. Anyway, she had to go back and get some keys. Then she drove along the rowing sheds, which was the only place in which the boat could be seen properly. She got out and walked down to the beach and saw a fire going on and homeless people there. She could not see the boat because it was pitch black. She felt a lot better for having gone there because, boy, that sure was useful. <laughs> boy, was that useful. No, and no, no, Lisa, I think you probably put that out just before I said it. 
She didn't try calling him. She decided not to call him, but she'd rather go down and stare into the dark for no reason, see nothing, and feel better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, then. All right. Hi, Annie. Annie Haley's here. Hi, Annie. Um, <laughs> um, nonsense regarding her failure to call. I mean... That's really hard to believe, especially for females. I'm sorry, but some of the, some, I'm sorry, guys. Some of you are just like, well, I didn't think about it. It's like, really? And I might believe it. I'm not believing it. I'm sorry. That just seems strange. Okay, then it gets stranger, even yet. In that interview, Sue here was told that the red jacket police had shown her on the morning of the 27th, they had found this red jacket hanging on a fence down there. And they said, is this yours? And she said, no, it's not mine. Well, then they found her DNA on it. And so she's like, oh, yeah, maybe it is mine. <laughs> and then one of the claims later on is she just kept, she picked up a lot of different jackets for working on the boat. And she just didn't remember that one. So it just happened to be off her boat hanging on a fence in that area. So, okay. So at any rate, due to all of these things, uh, they thought she was guilty of doing something to him. Uh, now, you ask, the, what, what is the motive on this? Apparently, there's, there's a bunch of interesting things about the motive. One is that they were falling, they were on the way out, uh, that they weren't getting along. She was fed up with him. She wanted out. But he had a lot of money, and she would get a lot of money. Let's put it that way. She, she ended up, you know, if she hadn't been convicted, she would, she would have cleaned up. Let's put it that way. Um, also, it was a very strange story that 12 years prior, she had talked to somebody about doing him in and dumping him in the ocean and sinking the ship. I, I, don't, I can't verify that story as being accurate or true, but interesting story. Um, so, anyway. So, on August 20th of 2009, she found the police there and they arrested her and she was charged with murder. However... During the legal proceedings, um, a DNA profile of the then unknown female from the bow, 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 bow of the yacht, right? <laughs> of the yacht on the starboard walkway was matched with DNA profile one Megan Vass. Um, so they finally found out at that point who this girl was. So um, now, they, now they had a second possible suspect. <laughs> the woman is an unbelievably terrible liar. Uh, it, it, it's, it's certainly concerning. Um, uh, there, yeah, there's many conflicting statements and, and as let me, let me put up the reasons, uh, so I can show you what the, 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 the innocence folks and her, her support group says are her reasons. Is, is this it? No, that's a, that's a silly scenarios. Okay. Where's the reason thing? Okay. That's the, why she thought she was guilty. That's why she thought she was guilty. Where's the, oh man, uh, don't you tell me that's gone missing now. Dang it all. Where did it go this time? Oh, I'm so annoyed again. Hold on a second. I'm gonna see if I can I'm gonna see if I can find it. It was in my stuff, so okay. Okay, let me go do this. Hmm. But they had these these great reasons why why she was uh why she would have said all the silly things she said. And let me see if I can locate it. Uh where did it go? Oh, those are scenarios. Where did they go? Oh, drat. I, I've misplaced it. Darn it. It, did, it didn't come over from my... You know, I, I, what happens, I, tra I transfer things over, and sometimes something just slips and doesn't get clicked on and doesn't transfer over. But they had lots of them. She had amnesia. She, had, uh, she was in shock. She has Alzheimer's. Um, she's just, you know... And they, they, they just had this massive list of reasons why she would have changed her story five times. Um, and I think any rational person says this, this is a little bit pushing, pushing your luck for why she changed these stories, especially, oh, oh things like, I didn't want to let them know I, was, I left the house at night because uh, I didn't want to make somebody feel bad. Or, you know, things like that. It's just, just, just stuff that under these circumstances made no sense. Um, the, the reasons, I will put the reasons why the police believe that she did it. And, I did that. and this comes from, the, their, the, this is, comes from her, her team. All right. Um, this guy named Philip Triffitt offered a credible witness as, about previous plots that Sue wanted to kill her brother and Bob 10 to 15 years before. 
He, now they're admitting he was credible, which I think is interesting because they're, I mean, she basically says, you know, dump him overboard uh, with a heavy object and sink the ship. And they say he's, he's offered as a credible witness, and, but they're not pushing that he's not credible. Anyway, Sue vehemently denies the stories. Okay. Sue went down to the foreshore that night, but first said she was at home. Okay, and, and the reason was she, Sue was upset by a strange late night call from a, from a stranger about Bob's disturbed daughter. Bob had this weird daughter, Claire, apparently had like, I think she's psychotic. And she said something bad would happen to Bob on the boat, which is kind of interesting. Maybe she's psychic, you know, much as I don't believe in psychics. So anyway, it's a very strange call, but somebody called and they're trying to get hold of Bob. And that's why she supposedly went down there. Uh, the police believe that once she got that phone call and she got shook and that's when she went down and finished the job that she may have killed him earlier. And then she went back to finish the job when she realized that, you know, already people were starting to be suspicious of something, even in that weird way. All right. Now. Oh yeah. Okay. okay so, um, oh, I forgot this. This is where they put the, the, I, I, it wasn't a separate thing. This is where it is. No, they thought she was guilty because Sue said she was at Bunnings in the afternoon and not on CCTV. And their excuse is Sue regularly went and was confused about which days. Well, you would be confused about those days. You would be if you're talking about what happened a month later, you know, a month, a year, you know, you, you, you were not even talk. The police didn't talk to you about something. Let's say, let's say, for example, a woman was uh, murdered in a parking lot. Okay. And then they, they're suspicious about this guy. They come 30 days later to this guy's house and they say, were you at the store on that day? And the guy's like, I don't remember because if he didn't kill that woman, he would not remember being there necessarily. But this was the very next, this is the, actually maybe the same day or the very next day. They're asking her, where were you yesterday? Right after when you left the boat, it's not, you know, she should know. So I'm sorry. She, she shouldn't be confused about which day she was there. Sue was shown the red jacket. And at first said it was not hers. Now she said, now they're claiming this is this. Remember that when, when, when they, when they put these um, information sheets together, this is years later after the lawyers have all talked about how it would make, how it would work the best. Uh, it was an old one from the yacht. She didn't at first recognize. She did not recognize a, this red jacket because it was just hanging around on the yacht and she didn't know it was there. Now I'm going to say this again. I'm not a boater. Is that how you say it? <laughs> but it is a big yacht considering, but you know, usually when you have a c contained space, like on a boat, you just don't have a wardrobe with 20 or 30 different outfits in it. You usually have a pretty, pretty small wardrobe cause you can't fit much on the boat. So you pick what you need to be on the boat. So it's a little bit, again, unlikely that she would have no clue that this was hers. Um, uh, now, they, they, Peter Lorraine saw Bob, Bob alive at 5 p.m. So the gray dinging, dinghy sightings were not investigated. Okay, let me explain that. Now, what happened here was that, look at this picture. See the four winds is moored there. They are claiming that the witness, where the L is, he looked out and he saw the wrong yacht. And therefore he didn't see that, that Bob was alive at that time at 5 PM because it was this, there was this gray dinghy that went out or that was seen earlier, not her dinghy, but a different dinghy. And the claim is that that could have been the dinghy that this, this, um, the, the girl, the, the homeless girl and her two buddies were on, um, and they did him in, but they're saying he wasn't, they weren't looking at the right place. So that, so that wasn't even. Bob's yacht they were looking at. Um, so, so it didn't matter, Bob, you know, the dinghy could have gone out earlier and killed Bob earlier. That's, that's what they're trying to claim there. So, um, where's my thing here? Oops, not the scenarios. I don't want that one. Okay. Then they said that, um, relationship was said to be on the splits. Um, evidence to the contrary by Bob's sister. Well, you know, okay. Um, and then uh, there was a phone call made to check messages from their home phone to the cell phone. She was supposedly concerned to see if anybody called his cell phone. Bob had Sue's mobile phone. Sue doesn't remember this. Okay. Well, if the phone call was made at 3.08 AM from their home phone, 
Only Sue could have made the phone call. An outline of a woman seen in a dinghy that night. Witnesses can't remember if he was in an, uh, well, they couldn't really see clearly. So they say it was too, it was too hard to be seen. Okay, so, but that was, those were only some of the reasons why they thought that. Now, here's a really fascinating thing to me as to why it's hard to believe it's kind of not her involvement. And I go back to this map. She tied up that white dinghy there. All right. And then supposedly she had been out at the four winds out there in the water. She comes back and ties up the boat. Now, why is the boat, the dinghy then found with the luminol in it that they suspect went back to the ship and then was found over there at the other location? Who, wh you know, what is, they're, they're trying to indicate maybe somebody else took the dinghy. All right. Now, take a look at this. There's a lot of, there are a lot of uh, boats moored out there. Lots of them. How would anybody know, or just coincidentally, they stole the, the white dinghy. They stole her dinghy. And amazingly enough, they knew what dinghy, what they went out right to the ship that the dinghy belonged to, in spite of the fact there were all those other ships there. So they went out there and, and boarded that one and then dumped, them, dumped the dinghy in a different location. They just happened to match the white dinghy with that particular boat, which seems a little bit unlikely to me. Now let's go to the story of Megan, okay? So Megan, in her story, so anyway, she ends up, uh, they finally find out who she is. She does go to court. She says, I was never on the boat. So they thought it was a transfer issue, that somebody had been stepping on a dock and stepped on the boat. It somehow transferred. Maybe. I, I find that a little difficult to believe myself, but maybe. Well, let's look at what Megan said many years later on 60 Minutes, and I'll explain where I think something here is wrong. Okay. So anyway, she's 15 years old. She's in a homeless shelter. She checks out in the afternoon, supposedly to go to a friend's house. And she's supposed to arrive there and check in, which she never does. So she is kind of wandering about that night. And I don't know anything about the nights before, by the way, or right after. Anyway, she supposedly hooks up with her boyfriend and some other older dude, other older homeless dude. All right, so her story now if you watch this show, she pretty much cries and freaks out during the entire show. I say she's still, she's either um, uh, coming off of drugs or she's still doing them, but she was a wreck and she's crying through the whole thing. And they're asking her, why would you now come forward? After all these years, this woman's been in prison away from her family for 10 years. Now you finally admit you were on the damn boat. She always scared, scared, you know. And the inference is that if she spoke told the truth, her boyfriend would kill her or something like that. So um, now she tells the story, and this is basically her story. Somehow they ended up on the boat. On a, they got there on a dinghy. What dinghy? We don't know. They got there. To, and what she said was that her boyfriend, maybe this other guy, would, would go from boat to boat looking for stuff to steal. Okay? Now, I could not get a clear picture of this like you're going from boat to boat to boat but you know it's a lot of work to get in a dinghy go out to a boat and then get off the dinghy onto the boat and then have to you know to go from boat to boat on dinghies is not easy it is a lot easier in my opinion to walk on the docks and jump on people's boats straight from the docks bump 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 and see what you can grab i i find it odd that you would work to get in a dinghy and go all the way out to a boat but that's what the claim was, that that's what they, and I couldn't get a clear picture on whether that was what she was actually saying or that was just crap, you know, um, because again, it's hard to know because we're not getting, we're getting this kind of strange tale that's been edited on 60 Minutes. And they did like four or five different 60 Minute show on this and it's all a defense driven thing and it's edited to death and God knows what pressure they put on her or whether they paid her, they claim they didn't, or whether somebody else paid her, or whether she, you know, I have no idea. Or they gave her drugs, you know, who knows, to get her to say whatever. But anyway, here's what she said. Somehow she ends up on the boat with the guys, and Bob is there, and he says, get off my boat. And they get in an argument, and they beat him, and he dies. 
And then because she sees this violence, she goes on the deck and throws up. And that's all she remembers. And then she says, well, then I got in the dinghy and went back to the shore. And I'm like, but where are the two guys? <laughs> you know, well, he left them on the boat with the big guy. I mean, well, how did they get back? But she doesn't really know. I mean, she doesn't really know. <laughs> you know. So we don't really know what she knows and she doesn't know what she knows. Except now because her DNA was there, she's claiming she was actually there. Now, okay, so what the defense is claiming and what the Innocence Project is claiming is that she and his buddies did indeed go to rob the boat. That they didn't take, they didn't claim that they took the white dinghy, right? Because I think it is, again, the chances of them taking, actually taking Sue and Bob's dinghy and finding Sue and Bob's boat. Wow, what a quinky dink, you know? How amazing is that? And they don't, so they don't seem to go there. So they're like in this different gray one. Um, and they go out and they have them going out during the day, which I found a little weird because it's still light. I mean, I don't know quite when it gets dark, but I don't think it was dark enough. So they're going out there and they can be seen. And I think that's not too wise. Um, and their the other claim is that since there was no dinghy at that boat, that they thought nobody was there. Okay. That's, that's sort of reasonable. I can go with that. Uh, so they thought it was an empty boat and they jumped on to see what they could find and then ran into the boat owner and all went to hell. Then we would have to believe, we would have to believe at that point that after they killed him, supposedly bludgeoning, hit him over the head, that they went to all the work of putting him in the boat, using a winch, because one of the issues about the winch thing, um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, so I'm not an idiot here. Again, don't know a damn thing about boats, but let me just be sure I'm saying this correctly. Where the winch thing? It is a winch, right? Um, winch. I just want to make sure I have the, <laughs> the word correct. Winch. The winch on the boat. Okay. So they're on the boat. And apparently they need to the, move the body from the boat or get up and over and into the little dinghy thing. Well, if you're alone like Sue might have been, you would definitely need that winch because you could probably not do that on your own. But if you got one person in, you know, let's, let's, let's keep the girl out of it. She was probably so high on drugs, whatever she was, she was probably useless anyway. But the two dudes, you have one dude in the dinghy. First of all, I've got a dude downstairs, on a, downstairs on a ship. I know that's not in the hold. I don't know what the hell you call that crap. Below. Anyway, yeah, you beat, you beat him up. You got two guys, you can carry his body up to the deck. Then you can get one guy in the, in the dinghy and the other guy can just dump the guy over the boat. You can in, hand him over to the guy in the dinghy. You don't need a winch. You don't need to do all that. You know, so that didn't seem to make sense that if you have more than one person, you would need to use the winch. Uh, secondly, that if they hit him over the head, why not just dump him overboard and just, you know, look like he just, you know, as an older guy just lost his balance, whacked his head, and then he fell overboard. Why not do that? Why go to all the work of taking him way out to discard his body, to hide it? Why would they come back onto the ship then and try to sink the damn thing? And, and how would they know where everything was to do all of this? It seems too much for a bunch of, a couple losers to do. It just does. Um, so I have trouble with the theory, um, except we do have Megan's DNA on the deck. All right. So if there is, the question is, does anybody have a different idea? I have a couple ideas of how her, her DNA could have ended up on the deck. Does anybody have a thought on that uh, besides me? Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to just read back what you have to say. Uh, there was not an aha moment. The totality, thank you for the word totality. Lisa, you know, warms my little heart when anybody says the word totality. The totality of what she said and did didn't, uh, didn't do is certainly suspicious behavior. Again, the issue of totality, you know, one, one thing is, is, is often not enough for us to be comfortable with saying, okay, that, that proves anything. But when you put 10 things together, when you have her lie, change your story five times, 
and none of and all of these things don't make sense. The the lies that she said don't make sense. The fact that she say she said she stayed home all night and now she's run, now she's leaving and now the dinghy has she said she tied the dinghy up well but the dinghy didn't accidentally come loose that's something they pointed out that the actual rope which it had a fancy name for it uh, the rope was inside the dinghy in other words if it, it had pulled loose from the dock it would have just the rope would have fallen in the water but that's not what happened it was inside the actual dinghy so that Mike makes it more look like somebody got back to land and just let the dinghy go, but the rope was still in the dinghy. So all the things she says don't make sense. Though no, not phoning him and saying, I went down there and looked at darkness and felt better. These things don't make sense. So the totality of her story stunk. And that's why the police are like, Shh, she did this. First of all, she even, somebody said she had the scenario years ago. She's breaking up with him. She's got the motive for money and her story doesn't work. And she does know that ship. She knows, I know, boat, ship. She knows that, <laughs> catch, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say kvetch, that's not right. <laughs> she knows that, you know, what's on there. She's worked with the workmen. So she knows what the problems are. She knows how to, that there's that, the hidden stuff that there's hidden. So that's why they looked at her. They just couldn't help it. No, but, but, but why? Oh, that's a great question, yes. Anne says, were other boats robbed? As far as I could learn, no. There wasn't any issue with right then and there of, of boats being robbed, especially, and, I, and I, I tried to find this out. Again, I pointed out the difference between the boats that were docked. You know, you can jump on and off those boats with ease. You can. Um, usually they're locked up. You know, you know, people can leave the boat. They theoretically lock them, but maybe they don't. Um, uh, would, wouldn't you rather just jump on one of those suckers and see what you can grab rather than have to get in a freaking dinghy and go way out to some boat and, and board it? I mean, I'm sorry, but no, I didn't hear about any of those boats out there that were moored being broken into, uh, or involved in drugs or all the other scenarios, serial killers jumping from boat to boat, killing the, <laughs> no, I, I didn't hear of any of that. Um, so there was nothing to support that at all. Um, so I, did, I didn't find that out, uh, that it was a vessel. Ooh, it's called a vessel? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I say, if I were one of those people on the jury, I'd be just as screwed as them. You know what I mean? I, would, I wouldn't have that. Um, why no DNA from the boyfriend and the older man? Perhaps it was transfer DNA from her being in the dinghy. Um, yeah, there was no DNA from the other two. The claim was because she threw up. That's how the DNA got there. On just the deck, not any place else, but just right there where you come onto the boat. So I have another theory on that, which I don't, I'm not saying is any good at this point, but um, could she have been in the dinghy? As well? Oh, wait a minute, let me put that back up. Transfer her DNA from her being in the dinghy. Well, we have no evidence that she was ever in the dinghy. Uh, supposedly she was in a different dinghy. That was the gray dinghy that they saw, not the white dinghy that belonged to Bob and Sue that was floating around in the morning. Um, it was the one somebody said they saw a different kind of dinghy going out. Um, and so theoretically she was never in their dinghy. So could it have happened? I guess it could have, but um, let's see what this says. Um, Oh, here's an interesting point. Anne says, if you're robbing from the dock, it's probably easier to get caught. Um, there is a point to that. I, you know, I think you have a reasonable point. So you're, what you're saying um, is that if you, if you go out, um, if you go out into the, into, they call this a river, but it looks like a bay to me. I don't know. But anyway, if you go out here, and you're on your little dinghy, and and you pull up there. I would think you better not pull up during the day. I, I find that, you know, maybe you could. And then you jump on board. Uh, that these people are too far away to really see what's going on. But if it's during the day, I find that hard to believe because during the day, not only are boats moored, but boats are coming and going, and and people have things like you know binoculars and stuff. You know, they might see you. I find it kind of scary to do. Um, but you know, you might notice one where you was kind of by itself and you could slide next to it and just try to get up. I guess you could. 
as far as the docks go, um, I mean, in general, that is where more robberies take place, as far as I know. Now, maybe I'm, I'm ignorant on this, but I, I believe in the past, I have read about, you know, I live um, near Annapolis, Maryland, and there's a lot of docked boats um, there. And there are, there are cases of people getting onto the boats and stealing stuff because lots of people walk up and down these things and all you have to do is look around and see that nobody's watching and you can jump on the boat and see if you can get into it and sneak down there and come back out. That I find this is much, much more likely. Uh, a lot of work to get in a damn dinghy and go out to a boat. A lot of work. Um, and, and, and Robert's usually lazy. And yes, it, it, you know, maybe they thought it was a bigger, fancier boat and would have something, but I don't know. Uh, but um, I will tell you my theory is possible what could have happened. <laughs> One dinghy, two dinghy. I'm getting dinghy. <laughs> yeah, me too. I tell you. Um, let's see. Aaron says, if you're wrong. Oh, I, I had a different comment here. Uh, okay, um, now I was trying to think what other way outside of transfer, which it could have happened, transfer could have happened, but it's, it seems pretty rare that her, her, somehow somebody, somehow it transferred onto the deck. I, I mean, it could have because lots of people are coming and going, but it seems to me like there would be, um, uh, oh, is Sue strong enough to lift Bob, put him in the, a dinghy? Time to fire extinguisher and toss him. No, that's why you have to use a win a winch. What, what is it called now? Okay, hold on a second. Winch? Is it called a winch? That's why she needed help because she probably wasn't strong enough to bring him up and into the boat. But if you tie him up to that thing, you can then do that. Yes, uh, that's why you use those things um, because they help you with the with the um, with the mechanics of it. Uh, uh, that no, that's how you do it. Uh, so yes, and then throwing them over wouldn't be that hard. But I think she would have to use that, that um, I don't know why I have such a problem saying that word. Winch, winch, yes, winch. Um, yeah, that's why I use those. Um, so that's what the police thought. Yes, she could do it. First of all, again, um, again, she was just like Bob. She was somebody who spent time on ships or vessels. So what do you want to call them? Um, you have, you know, I'm a, I will tell you, I have got the weakest arms you'll ever meet anybody having. Now, I, I can punch for some reason. I can do martial arts, but I, I can't arm wrestle anybody. I lose to my granddaughter. She's eight. <laughs> it sucks. But my arms, I've never had strong arms. Something in our family. We're just not strong arm people. And um, so me pulling ropes is tough. But, you know, somebody who has been athletic and has spent a lot of time pulling ropes may, may be pretty strong. Um, and, and don't let the, she was in her 50s, so what? You know, he was in his 60s. I don't believe that he couldn't get in and out of the dinghy either. I think that's nonsense. I've seen some perfectly strong 50 and 60-year-old people out there on the water. Um, so they can definitely do that. Okay, there's an interesting point. Okay, Rob, I think that's a good point. Could she have hired help to kill him? All right. Let's look at that theory. Since since the defense wants us to look at serial killers, more, <laughs> well, they didn't put aliens. Okay, serial killers, drug smugglers, uh, all these other theories. Okay, let's throw out that theory. They didn't want to look at that one. Could she have? She could have. She could have paid some some bum, some homeless guy, and said, "Look, go out there and dump his body for me." She could have done that. She could have paid somebody to go out and kill him. She could have. There's not, you know, that could be why Megan's DNA was there. I don't think that's the answer, but I, it's certainly a reasonable theory along with the rest of them. Um, I don't think she would have hired Ma Megan. No, not Megan. No, oh, Megan. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, the guy, Megan's boyfriend was the one who was supposedly the robber. And there's an older guy, too. It would have to be one of the men, not, not Megan. She's, she's out to lunch. She's completely out to lunch. But could she have paid somebody, in theory, you know, um, go, go and take care of this, this for me? And in, in that particular case, it's interesting. Let's say, for example, let's say she killed him. Let's say she killed him during the day and she's back home. She said, like, what the hell am I going to do? She goes down there and says, hey, take my dinghy. I'll pay you money. Take my dinghy and just dump him. I'll tell you how to do it. And Megan goes with her boyfriend and she sees, oh, my God, dead guy. You know, um, and then they dump him and they come back. 
Could it have happened? I guess. Could have happened. Uh, I'm not saying it's as likely, but it could have. Um, wouldn't, would, wouldn't Sue know how to basically use a winch? Yes, she would. It appears possibly Sue and Megan were both involved. I don't think Megan was involved in anything. The, woman, the woman's too out to lunch. First of all, she's a 15-year-old drug addict homeless girl. <laughs> she's, she would steal things, I'd believe that. But she's a druggie, and she, she was just, she was, uh, I don't think she could do anything. So, no, it would be her boyfriend. She seemed, the claim was she was terrified of her boyfriend. You know, uh, she spoke up that they would do something to her. So, she would have been the tag along and not anybody heavily involved. Now, here's a theory I have. What do you think about this? Because I, I wonder if this could be true. Let's say, for example, maybe they were out and about. Maybe they were out and about earlier, maybe even the day before. Let's say they're out in their own little thing, just zip, but zipping around the harbor, and they see the, the boat, and they come up to it, and they think, hey, we'll just get on this one, man. And they start climbing up, and, and, and Bob comes out and says, get the hell off my, can't you get the hell off my vessel? vessel. Uh, and they go, all right. And meanwhile, Megan's going like, she's up there, and she's like, oh, I feel sick. Blech. Not because she saw dead bodies, just because she's doing too many drugs and maybe whatever else. She throws up a little on the deck or spits on it or whatever. And they go, okay, man, okay, man, sorry, man. And they go back in their, in their, their dinghy and go away. And then Bob comes home and he says to, says to, uh, or no, to, uh, or maybe even Sue was there. And says, man, you know, stupid kids tried to get on the board, board, the, board the boat, you know. I told them to get the hell away from my boat. And Sue's like, hmm. That's useful. I can just say guys are trying to break into boats. Maybe that's how Megan's DNA got there. But now the problem is when Megan's found out that her DNA is there, would she want to admit she had been on the boat even for three seconds? Because now she'd be connected to a homicide. She go, oh, I wasn't there. Of course she'd say she wasn't there. And her boyfriend's going to go, well, don't say that we were on that stupid boat. You know, we were, we were only there for one damn minute. But don't tell, don't tell the police we're on the damn boat. They'll think we killed that dude. She goes, oh, I'm not going to say anything. And now, years later, they're pressuring her, pressuring her. Tell you we're on the boat. Say your, bo your, your, you know, your boyfriend killed him. Free this woman from prison. The girl's a druggie, you know. Who knows what they offered her? Who knows what they pressured her to say? She might have then said, okay, fine, I was on the boat. They killed her. All right, fine. I can't tell you any more because I don't know anything more, but okay, I'm going to say that. But, I mean, it's a much more likely possibility that they were in a dinghy that went up to the boat and they were being drunk or disorderly, tried to climb aboard or whatever. Maybe they were trying to steal something and they were just told to get the hell off of there and that's why it came from and they had nothing to do with the homicide. But certainly, as hell, I'm not going to admit to being there. You know, um, that's a more likely scenario than the whole other one and that sue just miraculously at the same time got mixed up in this whole thing you know just it was just amazing she just couldn't remember where she was and her her own dinghy just ended up with luminol all over it and you know so those things uh any priors for the druggies um she had priors because that's how they found her dna matched um I, I don't know. They never really mentioned who the other people were. Um, so I really don't know. Um, I'm going to say probably they had priors. <laughs> um, Megan reminds me of Helen, Helena Stokely from the Jeff McDonald case. Yes, she does. She reminds me of a lot of that too. And the problem is when you have druggies and you have misfits and miscrants, they do a lot of stupid all I can say is stupid crap. You know what I mean? They do. They, they're, uh, trespassing is big for them. Maybe they want a place to sleep. Maybe they, they want, they like fun. Hey, let's just go on that boat, man. It'll be fun. Hey, let's see if they got anything to drink on the boat. That, that, it isn't necessarily that they're trying to commit a major crime. It's just that they do a lot of stupid crap because they're homeless and they're on drugs. So they do stuff. They sneak into places. There was a theory that that's how... Um, that there were some homeless people near that, that shipyard that was doing the uh, testing that had brought the ship, the, the boat up, right? So there was theory that they were hanging out there and jumped on it there. And it's possible. I just don't know what the security was at the time. 
or, or that the boat didn't get good security while it was just in dock temporarily after the, they brought the boat in. And were they, did they just come down there drunk and just jump on the boat for a second and then jump off the boat? It's possible. So when you get these kind of people, they can throw a wrench into a lot of things just because they have stupid behavior, which isn't necessarily that they were committing a major crime, but just stupid behavior. So I don't know, but I find if if Sue's um, if Sue hadn't fi didn't have five changing stories, <laughs> and if there wasn't the issue of the ship being sunk by by means of a person who knows how to do that, if there wasn't a need to use a winch to move the body, um, if there wasn't a good motive, which there was, um, if there wasn't the issue of the uh, the um, the dinghy supposedly being tied up and then ending up someplace else untied up as if either she used it and knew to go to the right boat or just by coincidence somebody else grabbed it and went to the act of all the boats in the harbor they picked the exact one that matched the, the dinghy which is pretty unlikely um so all these things put together the totality thing uh yes i think oops i think this i think that yes i think megan is the red herring um i just i can't come up with if i'm weighing it if i'm weighing it let's go back let's let's go back to our uh our uh our suspect list which is only two in spite of what the the innocence people would like to say this or this and she unfortunately has everything very heavy in her way uh, all the circumstantial is very very there's a lot of circumstantial evidence uh, supporting her being involved and over here we have this one physical thing one piece of dna which is not really well explained and then a, then a 10 year late confession which she can't actually explain anything <laughs> except for i was on the boat they killed him and that's all i know and now admittedly the girl's a druggie, so maybe that is all she remembers. But I just wonder, you know, why she's saying this at this point in time. She says, well, I feel bad for her. Well, not for 10 years you didn't. Um, and now I'm not scared anymore. Or, or was she pressured? And when you look at the way 60 Minutes manipulated this interview, and I just don't know how many people are out here manipulating uh, somebody like her, who's easy, easy to manipulate with money or drugs. She's just simple for that and so i don't believe that she just came you know, willingly forward nobody offered her anything she just wanted to just to save her life i i'm having a little trouble with it and um so i don't know that i believe it oh <laughs> lisa says i've got to go not going to bunnings well that's good thanks so much for covering these aussie cases we'll catch the rest later loved your presentation that's pretty much most of it lisa so you're here for most of it bye chat see you next time <laughs> everybody says bye bye <laughs> oh well this was um uh you know I, I i this is one case where i gave at least you know i was like maybe maybe she maybe she's innocent maybe she really is because of the dna issue um but i haven't been able to have the, this dna issue override everything else here um and when she when the appeal came up the appeal basically said the same thing. They're like, sorry, that's just not it. There's just not enough fresh information that says she didn't commit this crime. We, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't see it. We don't think it's sufficient. And they didn't overturn it. Um, and, of course, it makes people really angry because the belief is if her DNA is there and she confessed, then clearly she's innocent. And there's an explanation for every single thing else. Maybe there is, but it's hard to believe. You know, maybe there is. Um, uh, I would like to have known some more pieces of information um, about all, all kinds of things. If I were investigating this, I would still want to know a lot more about how far, exactly how far it was to go, how many, how many other boats were nearby, moored nearby, um, how many people would have seen things as everybody go home at night so it's completely empty out there. I want to know all these other things, uh, and, but I'm not investigating this case. Um, and so I did see what the jury is presented with and I felt sorry for them because I said that was, I mean, I, you know what I really believe? I believe that they, 
So they, they sat there through torturous, torturous days. And when it came to the end, they just listened to the final arguments of the prosecution and the defense and made up their mind based on the last two hours of the entire production. <laughs> and I think this happens a lot, you know, that after a while, they're so confused. There's just no way in God's earth they can, in this short period of time, that they can understand and, and, and be able to uh, process all this information coming in on all these different subjects from all these experts, these people off a bus stop, as I always say, 12 people off a bus stop who know nothing about anything that's being talked about, who are not allowed to do any research, who are not allowed to spend time, you know, understanding the topics or the subject or, or the scientific stuff. They're not given any time. They just have experts just throwing crap at them. And, and, and the defense lawyers and the prosecution just saying so many things. It's like, it's like you're in a whirlwind of, of, of words and ideas, and there's no way they can understand this crap. And so I think they get down to the end, and they're like, I'll listen to the prosecution's final argument, the defense's final argument. Hmm, let's see. I'm going to go with that one. <laughs> and and, and that's, a sad, that's a sad part about this entire the, the civil, civil, civil jury system, which I so, you know, despise. Um, because I would, again, I would have liked to have been chosen to work on a case like this, but I would also like to have the ability to do some questioning of my own and to analyze things and have time to analyze it. When I'm saying, wait a minute, I want to know more about this. I want to find out more about this. I don't want to depend on somebody just yelling at me, you know, in the courtroom, yelling at somebody else in the courtroom. And I'm like, wait, wait, you know, I have a question and I'm not allowed to ask that question. You know, how can I make a proper judgment unless I'm give, given the opportunity to truly understand what I'm making the judgment about. So, um, and says, Sue must have, good, have had good lawyers and if she's innocent, they should give a refund. Um, um, I don't know how good her lawyers were. I mean, they're, now that now they're trying to get her the best lawyers now, you know, now that they've got a huge, uh, you know, fund for her, um, they're trying to get what's her face from making a murder. Uh, uh what's, what's her face? Ah, uh, um, the defense lawyer that, that everybody thinks is so amazing now who trying to get, uh, um, what's his name off? Um, nah, I'm just blanking. It's getting late over here. It's late at night. Uh, making a murder. Um, what's her face? Um, <laughs> attorney. Okay, attorney, or Kathleen Zeller, Ka uh, Kathleen Z Zellner, Kathleen Zellner. Um, yeah, thank you, Carrie. Carrie comes in, Kathleen Zellner. Yeah, Kathleen Zellner. Um, she's the one that is trying to get St Stephen Avery off of making a murderer. And uh, I, I, in my opinion, you can watch my making a murderer uh, uh, thing on Stephen Avery. I did a video on it. He's guilty as absolute hell. I've never seen so much evidence in that makes, you know, makes this, this case is a lot more questionable, but the Stephen Avery case, there's no question. And, but Kathleen Zellner is being paid a fortune and she's got huge publicity. And now she's like everybody's go-to girl for getting, getting somebody out of prison who the people claim are innocent. Um, and so they're trying to get her now for this. Um, but they failed on the last appeal. Um, but it wasn't fairly strong circumstantial case. I'll tell you that it was a very strong circumstantial case. And the, you know, the problem comes in, down to when you don't have another, when, when, the, when the circumstantial evidence is really strong that you did it and they can't come up with a, any good real other choice. Now, yes, the DNA was there, but other than that, they couldn't, especially at the time they first did it, they didn't come up with any story about if she had, was there on the, but with anybody else and none of the evidence made sense for her to have been involved or the other men to even have been involved. And so the, even the appeal didn't come up with much, you know what I mean? And most of it came from the 60 minutes garbage. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, I'm not saying she couldn't, you know, get another appeal at some point and make, maybe Kathleen Zellner will come along and, and prove something or just make people the, the problem of, you know, reasonable doubt, reasonable doubt that somebody else could have done it and she didn't. You know, but we'll, we'll, see, we'll see if she gets she gets another round, another appeal. But they turned it down, and people are saying, you know, this is because we have a corrupt uh, corrupt legal system, a just corrupt justice system in Australia as well as in the U.S. Uh, we have a corrupt system, and that they railroaded her, and uh, there was no reason, there was absolutely no reason for her to be found guilty. But there was. Um, it's just that 
you can you can you can try to explain away everything she said and did um and she could be a whack job that completely lies all the time she's a pathological liar and she lies herself into trouble rather than out but then again how would they know where this hidden hidden item was underneath the floorboards that would would let the water into the boat how would they know why would they do all that why would they bother to do a lot of stuff that they did you know uh, so it's it's there's no proof that she and her friends killed this guy and as, as i pointed out my my more likely story would be that they pulled up at some point to the boat and tried to board it being drunk and stupid and they were just told to get off and that was where the dna came from it could be that simple and she's just not they're just not going to admit they were on some dead guy's boat because they'll get they were afraid to get nailed for homicide wouldn't you be afraid so you know there's reasons people lie that makes sense there's reasons people lie that only makes sense if they're trying to get out of what they did so um you know i i lean this way uh i just don't have enough that makes me i have a problem with her massive line i do and her massive story changing that she only changed the story when she got caught you know the, and, and when she thought she had to explain something away then she changed her story and I, oftentimes that's what you find with a lot of psychopaths um, when the, when they commit crimes that's what they do they, they 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 will lie straight to your face and then you'll say but we know that we have a camera that says you weren't there then they go oh yeah that's right i wasn't there <laughs> they'll change on a dime to match what evidence they think you have not because they're telling you the truth so they will finally admit to certain things. So I, I can't believe she did not know she didn't go shopping that day. But as soon as they said, we don't have any video of you in that store, she's like, oh yeah, maybe it was another day. Really? So the day after, the, the very day after your, your, your loved one goes, is, goes missing off your boat, you can't remember what you did the day before. Yeah, I don't, I don't buy it. Sorry, not buying it. You know, along with the fact I never left the house, but oh, then you did. And you didn't call him. But you just went down there to look into the dark and made you feel better. Things like that. This puts up red flags every place. So the police had reasons to think she was guilty. There's no question they had reasons. And she was the one with a strong motive. Because she, she would have ended up quite well off. If she could get, get rid of the guy that she said was annoying the crap out of her. At this point, the relationship supposedly was falling apart. So... But, you know, there are people who will, will disagree with that and they'll keep up the Innocence Project thing going. Um, and she'll have her support team um, and they will try to convince on 60 Minutes uh, being the usual kind of video, kind of, I've had my issues with 60 Minutes. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, I know that they go with agendas and they're perfectly willing to, to lie and to um, edit because they did it to me. So I'm very aware of that. Um, and it happened to me with 60 Minutes Australia. So, yes, I do know how that works. Uh, <laughs> and so I don't trust them. And so do I believe they would pay somebody? Do I believe they would push somebody? Do I believe they would do sneaky, crooked things to get to, to, to get a show, to make ratings? Yeah, I do. I happen to believe that. I don't, I don't think they're trustworthy, trustworthy journalists, so I do believe that. So... You know, uh, I'm going to stick right now with the evidence that's known and the evidence right now heavily supports that she still looks more guilty than, than this side of it. So, um, Jose Baez is trying to get Dr. William Hussle off on 14 counts of murdering his patients in Columbus, Ohio. His latest verb is he's trying this week to get the Ohio Supreme Court to disqualify the judge. Jose Baez. Well, there's another. That's the U.S. Uh, Yes, that's a, yeah, he's, he's the other Kathleen Zellner. I mean, he doesn't care. He, he's got no ethics whatsoever. I mean, so, you know, he'll, he'll, do, he'll do whatever he makes money on and gets publicity on. Hmm. Um, when you lie to police during an investigation, it doesn't help your innocence claim. This is true. Um, and it's documented that she lied. And she admitted she lied. So, you know, she admitted she changed her story. She didn't admit she lied. She admitted she changed her story. Um, Changing a story usually means you're lying. <laughs> I mean, there's um, rarely a reason for changing a story unless you like, truly for some reason you didn't remember you did something and, and there's some reason why you wouldn't have remembered. But her story is really shaky, shaky, shaky. Um, 
It didn't work. Closing arguments start next week. Which closing arguments? Closing arguments. Oh, for the uh, Dr. William Hussle or whatever how you pronounce that guy's name. I'm glad it didn't work. Um, jeez, you know, it's just, you know, sometimes it's just amazing to see that what defense lawyers will go and say on behalf of their clients, you know, and it's like, you'll say literally anything, especially after the, you know, K Casey Anthony case. I mean, Ho Jose Bias is, you know, I've known snakes I like better than that guy. So, you know, and I, and I, I know this, the old saying, you have the right to a good defense, but I also don't think defense attorneys should be lying pieces of garbage. And I, you know, and once, once they are, and they're willing to, th to do things that I, that are completely wrong, un totally unethical. I'm sorry, I have no sympathy for you, and I don't have to be nice about you. I don't have to say, oh, it's a good thing, you know, you're just doing your job. No, no, you're not just doing your job. You're going way above what you should be doing for your job, and you're trying to get a guilty person off, and you got Casey Anthony off, and you shouldn't have. The, the woman k killed her child, and you got her, to, got her off. Be proud of yourself, Jose, but I guess you are. <laughs> You're probably as psychopathic as she is. <clears throat> but that's only my personal opinion, and it's not a psychological evaluation because I am not a psychiatrist. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Uh, does the Innocence Project really believe the people they help are innocent? Or do they like the challenge and game of getting people off for crimes they probably committed? This is a great question. I'm going to leave this up. This is a great no, my, I can't see my mouth. Um, this is a great question. Um, my problem with the Innocence Project is exactly that. Uh, I believe if you, if you bill yourself as a group that is trying to um, help innocent people, people who have truly been railroaded, and gosh knows, I have said, I have a, some cases where I believe the person is innocent who, is being, who has been railroaded. Uh, one of my, the strongest ones I've said is the uh, Martha Moxley case. Um, uh, I've st stood very strongly that um, I believe that uh, Bob, I forgot his name. <laughs> Somebody tell me his name. <laughs> Shoot. Darn it all. Um, t Tommy? <laughs> I'm just blanking here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, too, there's too many names in my head. That's the problem. It is, it is, it is, not, it is not Alzheimer's. It's, it's, it's 5,000 cases running in my head at one time. Come on, Martha Moxley. Somebody put it out. Thank you. <laughs> Michael's cake. <laughs> okay. I did a whole show on this. So I have a show on this and you can go look at it. It's about, Mar uh, I believe Michael Skakel did not kill Martha Moxley. Um, I did a, I did a television show on it. I got, I got edited and libeled on that. So that's one of the things that stopped me from ever doing another television show. I was off the oxygen channel. Uh, and so now that I've done my own on YouTube, I can say on YouTube, clearly exactly all the reasons I believe, uh, Michael Skakel did not kill Martha Moxley. Um, I think he was railroaded. And so, but the Innocence Project didn't want to, the Innocence Project wasn't interested in Michael Skakel because he wasn't a popular character. And sometimes they like popular characters, although I haven't figured out why Stephen Avery, Stephen Avery is like the one I can't understand at all because that guy's a creep and a half. I mean, he's, he's like burning up cats in the fireplace. I'm sorry, I don't understand why anybody likes even why anybody would want to support Stephen Avery. Oh yes, I do know why. Because Stephen Avery was convicted wrongly of the first crime. And so they want to stick it to the government. And so the Innocence Project is trying to prove that the government are railroaders. And so because of that, they were willing to go after the second one. Um, yes, I believe what happens at the Innocence Project, and this is what bothers me, is I believe as you truly think that person's innocent um, and you want to find the evidence that will help them be freed from wrongly being imprisoned, I'm all for that. However, if your agenda is, to, is just anti-death penalty and you're willing to get anybody out who's on death row because it's your agenda, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with um, supporting people for the publicity, the massive publicity to any to most a lot of it stick it to the government stick it to the justice system prove that the justice system is unfair and inequitable to people um and they're willing to get people off on technicalities that have nothing to do with their innocence and 
And a lot of times they then they once once a technicality goes through, then they will promote this in the media as the person is innocent when there's no proof that they are innocent. And all the it's still very heavily proven that they were guilty. But people never find that out because the, they control the media so much that, that if you Google things, you'll go through 10 pages of the Innocence Project's media. And then you'll to get to things like the appeal, which is a great way to find out the truth. If, if you can find the appeal uh, transcript, then you can finally find out what how they were actually uh, convicted and, and how they got the appeal. Um, and, but yeah, and, and, and because they're not honorable, in my opinion, because they're not standing up for just really, truly trying to free innocent people. And I'm okay with that. I'm glad there will be an organization who try to free innocent people. But a good portion of the people they keep trying to free and have freed are guilty as hell. And, and I have no, if you know, and I believe they know they're guilty and they don't care as long as they can get them out. So like Michael, uh, like Stephen Avery, I have zero respect for Kathleen Zellner. She knows that guy is guilty as guilty can possibly get. There's just no way in God's earth anybody who understands the evidence could think he's innocent. She doesn't care. She's an unethical human being, in my opinion, as is Jose Baez. So, yeah, I have a problem with the Innocence Project and the way they deal with things. I'm not saying that sometimes they don't do something that is good. Um, and when that happens, okay, that, that, I'm glad that that person got help. But, yeah, I, ha I have issues with... If you're not going to be ethical all the time, stop being there. You know, stop saying you're, stop saying that's what you're about. You know, when you when you when you're not doing that. Um, but you know, they get they're they're a very strong group uh, all the way around. They get um, college students to do a tremendous amount of free work for them, um, and then they they really pump the publicity and they just have such a strong presence because they're really strongly anti death penalty and strongly anti the criminal justice system, at least in the U.S. So, it's very problematic. <laughs> so anyway, um, so anyway, that that's it. This has been a, it's a really interesting case. It is one of the cases where at least it gave me something to think about saying, hey, you know, I'm not like, whoa, that person's guilty as hell. But definitely I see why she was convicted and I see why the appeal failed. Um, and they if they're going to try to get her out of prison, they need to come up with something that's called real proof and not just the fact that some drunk a girl could have happened to board the boat at any point in time, whether from, whether from their own uh, little dinghy where they just tried to climb on board and were told to get off or whether they managed to get on board when the, when the boat was docked after the incident or whether they got into the shipyard or whether it was transferred over. That, and unless they can find something better than that and, you know, try, just trying to explain away her piles of uh, changing stories and lies is not really going to work. So we'll see whether they ever come back with anything that works or whether they just get the public on their side and finally just say, okay, free her, you know, we'll all look good. And sometimes that's what happens. They, they, they get so pressured by the media that finally she comes out of prison and, and then everybody says, see, she was proven to be innocent. And that may not be the truth. It may be some technicality that got her out. And because of 60 Minutes and this girl saying, you know, I was there and they killed it. You know, a lot of people believe things because they're not willing to, you know, spend the time to find out the actual details of the case. So anyway, uh, I think that's it for me tonight. I'm going to head out to the, I'm heading out to the beach. I'm going to spend a few days with my granddaughter. Um, and I am doing a Sunday show, Sunday at 3 p.m. Uh, sorry. This week, Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern time, I got something to do earlier, so I had to have a little extra wiggle room. So it's going to be Sunday, 4 p.m. EST, and I'm going to do a second, a part two of the uh, Dennis Rader BTK uh, DNA issue. I'll have a guest coming on with me. Um, his name is Corey Smith. He's agreed to come on. He's done some research, found some interesting stuff, and we've been going back and forth on this the DNA information in the BTK case. And it is just such a conundrum that it's just fascinating. And we're going to discuss all the things we've been going back and forth on and why it's so hard to find out the truth about things and make a determination of, oh, yeah, this is absolutely the right person or this isn't the right person or which crimes did he actually commit? You know, yes, Dennis Rader is a serial killer. Did he commit all 10 of the crimes he claimed? Or is there something fishy going on here? Are they linking him to things he didn't do? But there's a, there's a DNA issue here, which we just, it's just bizarre. So we're going to be doing that. So I'm going to have my guest, Corey, on. I'm going to take my um, 
my little radio thing with my my headset down to the beach um and uh so it's gonna be 4 p.m on sunday est and again guys um if you want to participate in any of the live part of the show be in the uh chat rooms that you do have to join patreon for that i love to have a good community and not a bunch of people coming in who just want to cause trouble so yes uh, for all my live shows you have to be join patreon which does support the channel which really helps um uh, but you can always see the shows anyway and you're always free to comment below i'll always try to comment back no matter whether you are a, pat a patron or not um but do subscribe if you can uh helps out a lot um and you know uh and comment below and I try to keep up with everything and always welcome to have com uh, suggestions of other shows to do so that I can keep doing this educational channel and uh, having you great guys come here so anyway <laughs> thanks Pat another mystery I have fun on the beach and don't go sailing <laughs> I'm not sailing this weekend it's too cold it's gonna be like 45 degrees here we just we have we have a condo down at the beach and it's nice in the summertime but in the winter we're just basically hanging out and you know doing silly inside stuff so we'll, we'll have fun with that but uh, yes come out molly come to sunday and um it's going to be interesting to see what you think about all these different details we have on the on the dna for the uh, btk crimes so and, and you're, mo you're most welcome molly it is a tricky case it really is it's very tricky and you know i started reading it. I'm like oh you know I'm trying to wrap my head around all this stuff myself and it wasn't an easy one let me tell you so <laughs> but very interesting but very interesting um but the trick really is never buy a sailboat with somebody you don't trust you know I, you know personally I would have just I would have just gone further out into the ocean and you know it seems so much easier just to shove them overboard oh honey could you get that rope oops he fell I never understood, you know, oh, oh, so, so I'm going to say this. I forgot, I forgot to completely say this um, before I go and probably everybody's already left, but um, I don't know that this was premeditated. This may well have been a fight that broke out and she's maybe stabbed him even with a knife and therefore couldn't claim he fell overboard if he's been knifed. So if he's been knifed, she's got to get rid of the body. She does. I, I completely blanked on saying that. I can't believe that. Everybody's already run away. Um, I'll put a little note down in the thing below. But yes, I, there was a knife found, and I do wonder whether that was not the real reason that his body had to be disposed of, because otherwise there's easier ways to kill somebody off accidentally, you know, or I say, especially on a boat, people can slip. Uh, but if you knife somebody then you got a problem. So if she was out during the day with him and they had an argument and she she acts, she stabbed him and then he was already dead and she's figuring what the hell am I going to do with him and she's trying to figure it out. She goes back to pretend nothing happened and then she figures she'll go back out later and and try to do something about his stabbed body. I think that's also much more possible than that he was hit over the head with anything. I, I don't think so. I think it would be more of a stabbing. Uh, otherwise, you know, he could, yeah. That's what I would go with. So anyway, um, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. I hope so. Yeah, I hate it when I do shows and I can't remember everything I want to talk about until it's too late. It's like, ah, crap. <laughs> uh, yeah, that kind of explains her giving crazy story after story panic. Yeah, I mean, uh, that usually when people screw up, it's because they didn't plan things that well. I don't believe, I mean, premeditated, I think this would be stupid to premeditate this this way. When you can do it when you're sailing, you know, it's a little bit easier than when you're right there in port, you know, essentially. Uh, so, yeah, I would think it more was an escalated. They had a lot, I think a lot of bad things happening between them. Uh, a lot of frustrations. She seemed to be really annoyed with them. Now, now ideation comes before behavior. So the ideation of wanting to get rid of them might have still been there. But at this moment, oh, now I'm at that moment because now I, I'm screwed now. So maybe I better go through with that plan I thought about, you know, a dozen years ago. <laughs> Bob looks dead in the photo. That is like a, that is a really horrible picture of him. I don't know where they got this shitty picture of him. Isn't that awful? I'm like, what, what's, what, what's, what's the, uh, what's the um, uh, weekend of Bernie's? Is this a weekend of Bernie's? He's like, <laughs> I love, I got him. I love that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do love that movie. <laughs> Weekend of Bernie is one of the funniest movies I ever saw. So yeah, we exactly. Weekend of Bernie. So I mean, maybe it was Weekend of Bernie's. It's like, 
Yeah, that's a terrible picture. Dang. You know, the other picture of him was much better, so. You know, he looked lively then he was standing up, you know. But. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he might be already posed and dead. Uh, that, that, that may be true. Oh, my God. <laughs> what a way to end the show, right? So if you didn't stay around, it's too bad because we had fun at the end. So my, my other theory at the end and then Weekend at Bernie's put in together and <laughs> we don't want to leave on a, on a low note, you know what I mean? So anyway, so I will hopefully see you guys on Sunday for the BTK Part 2. Um, and then um, next week, there'll be a call in on Tuesday for those who are patrons at the top level. We're going to have the call in at 7 p.m. And then the hangout will be, wait a minute, am I in the right wig? Yeah, oh, then the, <laughs> yeah, the hangout was on Wednesday this week, right? Okay, so I'll do the uh, call-in on Tuesday and the uh, the hangout on Thursday. So, yeah, if you're a patron, you can join in on those things on the live part. And if you're not a patron, you can still come and watch every bit of it and comment below. So, again... Subscribe to the channel and support me, please. All right. <laughs> A perfect ending. Not for Bob. <laughs> Bob would disagree. <laughs> he would so disagree. Oh, jeez. Oh, no, I'm, no, I'm getting silly. Oh, my goodness. That's because it's 11 o'clock here on the East Coast, so I... <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head to my bed right now. All right. So, so anyway, I'll see you guys hopefully on Sunday. And again, I'm all, I will comment below and uh, I will respond to you guys below if you have some more things you want to say. So see you next time. Bye.